Hey everyone, welcome to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Christian Picasso, and the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast uh, aims to bring the best stories and tips. Stories and tips from those that truly make an impact within the sport of fly fishing. I'll dig into the past, present, and future of our guests, uncovering their amazing story and journey. Join me each week as I interview a new guest from somewhere around the globe. If you're not yet a subscriber, help by subscribing now so I can attract the most influential guests and sponsors to the podcast. Let's make this the top fly fishing specific podcast available. Today's show is brought to you by the following sponsors. Angler's Coffee, a brand of coffee for anglers by anglers. Owner Joan Monahan grew up fly fishing and after spending 40 years in the coffee industry perfecting blend and brew process, he retired to creating a coffee blend and brand for the sport of his passion. Go to www.anglerscoffee.com and pick up a bag of your choice. My personal favorite is the pre-ground caddis blend. It has a perfect balance of body, aroma, and acidity to kickstart my day. Thank you, Anglers Coffee, for supporting the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. We look forward to supporting you and your business. Again, www.anglerscoffee.com. Dupa Fish, that's D-U-P-E-A fish.com, www.dupafish.com. Coming soon, but head over now, pre-register, and make sure you are ready to receive all the notices of the great deals that we'll be having coming your way. With years of accumulated DIY, Todd and I have traveled and booked experience all over the globe. We know how hard it is to customize a trip to you and your group's particular needs. We will have a comprehensive list of service providers and guides to help you in selecting the perfect trip for your and your party's needs. Book a trip with us and have the adventure of a lifetime. That's Dupa Fish, www.dupafish.com. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fly Fishing Insider Podcast. This is your host, Christian Bacasa, and I'm here today with an old time friend, someone that went to Costa Rica with me and had his first salt trip, slayed it, of course, the week after we left, uh, we left with some good weather and when it's monster tarpon, et cetera, but uh, it's a good friend of mine, Tilted 3.0, Joseph Davies. Joe, how has it been, my man? uh things have been going really well man we had a great summer and um looking forward to a uh a super good you know salmon steelhead big brown season nice nice and you know when you and i met it was park city um i was at Duke yeah. Fish. you reached out to me like dude i want to be an ambassador how do i get this done we met hit it off right away started fishing together and uh went on our trip to costa rica and then sh- i think it was shortly after you you left. It was maybe three, four months, if that. That was right. Yeah, no. Um, yeah. Um, Costa Rica is always a complicated one. Um, we were supposed to go down for six days. I ended up for staying uh, maybe eight weeks um, <laughs> down there, um, basically, and, you know, until the wheels came off. And, uh, yeah, had an absolutely brilliant time. And if it weren't for you, you know, never would have uh, ventured down there. Yeah, that was an that was an awesome trip. I mean, we were there. The weather was really tough with big swell and whatnot, and it was difficult. But we got into a couple tarpon. But then after we left, it it lightened up, and you guys did really well. If I remember, you you landed like a hundred ninety pound tarpon down there or something like that. That's right. Yeah, we um we boated a we boated a bunch and. Um, yeah, ended up with a couple, couple pretty sizable ones. Yeah, yeah. and um, changed up leader technique, fighting technique. I know Mark Martin came out with me on the boat for a day and like showed me how to fight hundred pound fish and turn them, and that makes no sense to me still. <laughs> um, you know, he's like, "Turn that fish." I'm like, <laughs> "You're kidding, right?" <laughs> this thing out with me. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And, uh, but yeah, one of the absolute best experiences in my life was, uh, being down in Tarpenville with Mark. So that was, that was killer. That's cool. 
Yeah, I've talked to him a few times. He's doing pretty well, and we're talking about going back down there. In fact, we were supposed to head down there again, and then uh, COVID hit and shut us all down. Uh, yeah, I think that's the story for a lot of people. It is, it is, it is. Well, you were on the show a while back. Uh, you covered a lot of things, but uh, life's changed quite a bit, and um, you're doing some new things now. Now you're managing the, the Fly Fishers uh, Fly Shop. Uh, out there in Wisconsin, you've got some yep. personal guiding stuff going on. Um, what, what else is going on in your life? You know, um, above and beyond fishing, which I describe as like a socially inappropriate amount. Um, <laughs> uh, I do run, I, I run my own guide business. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the things that, I've become very myopic about is uh, smallmouth bass. Hmm. Um, so it's been one of those things that we, with several of my clients, figured out what they were doing pre spawn, what they were doing during the spawn, what they were doing after the spawn, um, what they did come summertime, what they come doing fall time. Um, and, uh, we had, we had a ton of success this summer and, 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 and yeah, it, uh, could, it couldn't have been better. It was just a dream. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, cool to hear. And it's funny hearing you talk about it because I know of your, your history in the past. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Joe was a, uh, very high end skier, um, aerials, and then you coached olympic level athletes so hearing you break it down like that uh it doesn't surprise me you're one of those guys that gets it uh goal oriented uh you know here's my objectives here's how i get to that goal etc so let's talk a little bit about how you broke down um you know trying to find the fish when and where and, and what river systems uh lakes etc you're fishing in Absolutely. Um, so I am primarily fishing the Milwaukee River um, waterway. Um, that's something that stretches from Lake Michigan, um, probably 40, 50 miles up, uh, up north. Um, and I fish it from Fiendsville north. Um, so I run a John boat mm -hmm. and, uh, can run in some pretty skinny water. We'll do some waiting. We've got a lot of boat opportunities and, um, yeah, it, it was just something that, uh, that kind of evolved from wanting to get into some, some certain water that I knew people couldn't get to without a boat, mm -hmm. you yeah. know? And, um, we were really lucky that that paid off, um, that this was a super good stretch of water. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah, you've got tons of waiting opportunities, tons of, you know, um, opportunities to be out of the boat but we suffered from what i think everyone else suffered from this year was low water okay you know so having this john boat that will draft in six inches of water was just an absolute dream um so we were able to get to a lot of spots on the milwaukee river that just kind of go a little unfished um and uh yeah we were able to um yeah i think in a way put that that section of the milwaukee river on the map a little you know yeah. um people just didn't think that big fish came from there and uh i can i can attest they do yeah yeah i can attest to it too i'm looking at your feed and there's some, <laughs> some big boys in there for sure uh you got some good looking pikes some really looking good looking smallies um you just go down the list here so what what was it that attracted you to the smallies especially because uh you know let's say uh pike pretty big sport fish to overcome in wisconsin <laughs> No, you're, you're absolutely right. No, I think, uh, what, what attracted me was they were really fish that were eager for a fly. 
that if you kind of figured out the equation of where they were at and meeting them where they were at, you know, whether it be a sink tip line, a, uh, a crayfish pattern, as opposed to a popper, you know, um, they were, they were, uh, yeah, just very eager to take a fly. And that was fun to me. And they fight so, so hard. You know, I mean, you'll have a 16 inch, you know, little small mouth and current put an eight weight into a queue. You know, um, it's it's pretty extraordinary the pressure they they can put on a fly rod. That is, you know, a lot of people talk about the power of them and um, how active they are when you when you hook them and how hard they eat and things like that. And I, I love catching smallies. I think it's just a blast, I mean, especially when you're on a lighter weight rod and you're not expecting it. You know, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to hook into a trout, and then bam, a smallie comes and smashes you. It's, it's pretty rad. Oh, absolutely. And you know it's a smallie. You know, they don't really leave any doubt when they take the fly. No, no, it's pretty good. You know? Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons you do it. I mean, you do it because of the take, um, you do it because of the way they fight. And I think that they're just gorgeous fish, you know, um, maybe it's, a, I don't know. I'm, I'm biased by Wisconsin colored glasses. <laughs> but no, I think it's an absolutely gorgeous fish. What what is it um <clears throat> when you started first targeting them, what was it that was different for you um in the targeting aspect compared to trout fishing? Because that was where your roots really were, was in trout fishing, right? Absolutely. Whether it was uh kind of out west or or New Zealand, um my Roots definitely were in trout fishing, and I liked that um, I had this river system right in my backyard here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where you, you've, you've got to pull pretty hard on those fish to set the hook. It's a strip set. No different than, you know, fishing in the ocean. It's a strip set, and oftentimes with these pike, you've got to hit them a couple times. You know, I mean, it's, it's really, I, I think it's as close to kind of an action sport as you can get in the fly world. That's not, you know, involved in the salt water. Yeah. I think, it, would you say the diff big difference is probably just the runs, right? I mean, they exhibit quite a bit of power, but they just don't run with saltwater fish. Oh, right? they it's can, bad. man. They, uh, I got to tell you, there was a couple a couple of fights this summer with fish that weren't that big. I was pretty sure I wasn't going to win that battle. You know, I was like, wow, you're really tugging. You're really running. You're almost in my backing, you know? And, uh, yeah, they just, they pound for pound, man. I don't know. I'd love to see a 10 pounder. I don't know what they fight like. Yeah. Yeah. That's a dream boy right there for sure. Yeah. So you're, you're fishing the Milwaukee. There's gotta be other waters around there that you're fishing. You fishing some lakes and things as well. And yeah. Other, a little bit. Um, and whatnot. Absolutely. Um, when it comes to our like salmon steelhead season, um, I focus a lot on smaller water. And I do do a lot of uh, kind of ESN style nymphing for um, the steelhead and the salmon, the big browns mm -hmm. um, in smaller water, um, swing streamers in bigger water. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but yeah, I don't know. The bass kind of stole my soul a little bit this summer. There was something. Yeah, I, I had every intention of doing a lot of other species, and it was really hard to talk somebody out of like, yeah, you're going to come on the boat, you're going to catch a dozen fish, and you have a chance at a 20. That's pretty slick. 
you know, so it was just, yeah, that, that just became my, my MO this summer. Nice. Nice. So let's, let's, uh, let's do this. What I really want to do is kind of break down, as you mentioned before, you studied quite a bit on this is this is high fish pre spawn, sour fish spawn, sour fish post spawn, right? Yeah. And some of the the tactics of where fish are located, what they're doing, why you're fishing this way or that way, and let's let's get pretty detailed. You know, I think our listeners really appreciate that. So um, absolutely. Before, before we do that, I want to kind of talk to you about um, you know here here a good story, um, uh, uh, kind of a layup story of. You had mentioned my boat. Sometimes it can get into some places that I wanted to go. So how about you tell us a story about one of those places you had thought about going, you went there and, 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 and you got some kind of result, whether it was expected or unexpected out of it. You know, um, I think it was, it was pretty expected that we knew if we went far enough up river um, during the pre-spawn um, that those fish were going to be going to be sitting in the shallows um kind of sunning themselves and uh we got out of the boat so we we dragged it for maybe maybe 300 yards beached it and then uh got out on foot uh me and one of uh my clients corbin and uh we were both fishing differently you know to try to figure out where they where they were most likely to eat and uh yeah it uh turned out he figured it out pretty quickly and uh yeah he caught a uh a 19 and a 20 that day so but we we expected it but you know i i think one of the biggest things is um having a grinder on the boat you know there's guys that can grind and guys that just that's not their jam Mm -hmm. um and i'll tell you you know i've got a couple clients that you know before they touch their first you know 18 inch bass they spend five hours on the bow of the boat right (laughs) you know making making casts and cast endless cast which is not the endless cast and and a lot of that pre-spawn activity was hanging out very very close to structure Mm -hmm. um so if you are 10 inches off that log you're not fishing that fish and and in this case this trip were you guys stripping streamers or were you yeah always always yeah Um, what what kind of setup are you using for that yeah so i generally um i use saltwater eights believe it or not mm-hmm. um uh because we do throw a little bit bigger fly i needed to handle a little bit heavier of a line so you're not false casting all day mm-hmm. um you need a shooting type line um and uh yeah and then beyond that uh is if we're a, fishing is it a floating line or a sink uh you know uh 90% of the time it's a floating line. Okay. And then are you fishing that with a, <clears throat> a long leader or in heavy, heavy fly or short? How, what do you set? Uh, pretty short leader, about an eight foot leader. Um, I really prefer um, scientific anglers, absolute bass. Um, I think that they just came out with a great formula. It's got a big butt section. It turns over flies super easy. Um, and, uh, use that in about the, uh, 12 pound breaking point. Mm -hmm. Um, I switched to 12 this year as opposed to 10. Um, I, I find that, um, if I'm really worried about lining bass, what I'll do is I'll chop off the last 18 inches of my leader. Um, I'll throw in a blood knot and then put my, uh, you know, either 10 or 12 pound fluoro on that, Mm -hmm. you know, it just, it being more abrasion resistant, smaller diameter, less visible to fish. Um, but we had a lot of situations this summer that the water was so low that we were sight fishing them like uh, almost like bonefish, Mm. 
you know, and that was really the MO of a lot of the trips was, you know, you're going to stand on the back of the boat. We're going to park it here and something's going to cruise by. Trust me. Right. And you're fishing 12 pound. Is that because you're casting the structure and things like that? And you're just, you know, um, I just like, uh, we didn't really run into a lot of small fish this year. Okay. Um, so I, I, I just felt like I wasn't lining them. I could have a little bit more confidence in my pulling power. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, that was, that was really about it. Yeah. I mean, especially I, I, you know, I wish I had a better reason, but now I switched, you know, open water, I'll still use 10, you know, because they don't have the current to fight against you. Right. Um, and in open water, uh, particularly here in Wisconsin, a lot of it can be quite clear. So I do go to that modified leader where, you know, I'll take the last 18 off and put fluorocarbon. Mm-hmm. That is, that's pretty good setup scenario there. Um, <clears throat> and you like that eight weight. You just like having that extra pulling power, like you said. Just... Yeah. Um, you can make it really seamless. And, you know, as seamless as you can make it um, with an eight weight. You know, I know, uh, I know a lot of people may go after bass with, uh, with smaller weight rods. Mm -hmm. Um, but for what we have here, when you're, when you're dealing with potential 20 inch bass, um, yeah, you want to make that, of, keep, yeah, you want to stuff too, right? I would and keeping them out of stuff. Oh yeah. No, they are so eager to run into everything. Yeah. You know, uh, stuff floating in the water, they'll find it. <laughs> um, yeah, it, yeah, they're extraordinary. Um, but yeah, now you're jumping them over logs and yeah, they're, they can be crazy when they get in uh yeah, tight quarters. Where, um, before we dive into the, the tactics that you're using, mm -hmm. um, you know, with the different spawning periods, et cetera. Um, what are some of your favorite things about fishing with people as a guide? I know that's different for you. Cause I mean, you, used to be just fishing by yourself or with buddies like me and whatnot. You're absolutely right now. And, uh, there is this level of stoke when maybe you gave somebody one piece of advice and it resonated and they made a great cast, mm -hmm. you know, and they strip set perfectly, you know, for the first time. Yeah. There, I, I couldn't be more excited at this point than if I had done it myself. Yeah. This probably takes you back to those coaching days, right? Yeah. It absolutely does. With, uh, like a hundred percent because with, with a lot of those things, I'm like, Oh man, you know, this is so gratifying. You know, I, maybe I impacted you in just a little bit of a way that made you a better angler. And, and the way I always look at it is if, if you don't get off my boat as a better angler, I haven't done my job, you know? Um, so when I get to see somebody, you know, take something, maybe I had mentioned and, uh, have it pay off, man, I'm, I'm jumping around the boat, man. I'm on their back patting them. And yeah, I couldn't be, I couldn't be more excited. That is cool. <laughs> it's always gratifying. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in management, right. And a lot of that is coaching. I enjoy the coaching side of it. And I, I get exactly what you mean by like, Hey, you show someone something or you're teaching them, you watch them actually execute on it. And it's, it's like, you're doing it yourself. Right. It's really oh, cool. And then some, you know, because they're experiencing it at a level that you experienced it the first time and it was amazing, mm -hmm. you know, and you can relate to them yeah. um, and then they can relate to you, right. you know, vice versa. That's cool. I like it. I like it. Well, hey, we're, we're, um, we're going to 
ready to dive in now. Let's dive into this pre-spawn, spawn, post-spawn tactics. But before we do that, let's hear from our sponsors. We'll come back, hammer these out, and uh, I think I have something uh, really good for us two to line up at the end of the show. So hang tight, Joe. We'll be right back. Right on. Angler's Coffee. We love fueling your next cast. We've been roasting coffee before coffee was cool www.anglerscoffee.com Dupa Fish coming soon. Pre-register now and get notified. www.dupafish that's d u p e a fish.com Welcome back everyone. We've got Joe Davies on the line tilted 3.0 on Instagram if you want to give him a follow. He's out in Wisconsin chasing all kinds of fish, uh, pike, uh, bass, uh, smallmouth bass, etc. But today we're really getting deep into the subject of smallmouth bass. Uh, Joe, I, you know, thinking about uh, you during these commercial breaks, and it's so good to hear your voice, man. It's been way too long. We got to get on the water again, but um, I'm really interested to have you share your knowledge that you picked up over the past couple of years getting into this warm water uh, stuff around um, smallmouth, and and we introduced that earlier about talking uh, to the um, tactics and tools that you're using on the pre-spawn, spawn, spawn, and post-spawn kind of timetables of that particular species. So let me kick her off with uh, the pre-spawn stuff and just dive right in. Yeah, no, um, uh, definitely what we found. um, And like I said, there's, uh, there's about three of us that got on the Milwaukee river and we've all, we all keep in good contact with one another. And uh, we just found that these pre-spawn larger fish were doing their thing and then hanging out tight, tight to structure. And it wasn't the type of fishing that you could do with a drift boat, you know, where you drift on past and, you know, you you, uh, lay out a great cast and uh, takes it on the first go. Um, it was a series of really figuring out the depths of where these fish were hanging out in these structures and then matching it to the fly. Um, so we used, uh, we used a lot of kind of dumbbell eye type flies, uh, flies that were swimming more in that eight to 12 inches of the water column. Um, something that you could put on a log and would drop quite quickly, um, to the fish underneath it. Um, and, uh, we found that to be really effective, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't as much about just the presentation or just the fly. It was the repetition it took for a lot of these pre-spawn big fish you know, we weren't catching them on the first cast, the second cast. It was 10 casts in. Mm. Um, so oftentimes we were switching up flies, switching up depths. Um, and I think that that was really one of the critical things that I learned early this season was don't necessarily switch out fly for fly pattern. Do it for depth. Mm-hmm. You know, so we may have run a neutrally buoyant fly at that fish, um, may have run something with small dumbbell eyes, you know, something with large dumbbell eyes, something large dumbbell eyes that soaks up a lot of water that's going to be pretty crayfishy. Um, but, you know, you do you do match the hatch, so to speak. You know, we didn't really do great on crayfish early in the season because they just weren't abundant in the river there was you know a ton more sculpin and white bait fish Mm -hmm. so we really focused on those patterns um designed a few of my own that um were sinking small white bait fish patterns um and uh yeah it, but it, it really was a matter of giving them a lot of options, you know, cast after cast after cast um, of getting these fish to move. Yeah. 
you know, and I've seen it in still water too, where, you know, you, you may see a fish holding, um, well away from its bed and you're stripping, you know, like a game changer right in front of it, <laughs> you know, and, and it doesn't move. And you're just going, oh, why is this? You know, and, um, you know, you give up on that fish real quickly um, because you go, it's not a player. But it was in the river system, we we got a lot out of working structure and chopping it apart tactically, just like you would a uh, a piece of trout river. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like dumping into a hole and. Yeah, I'm going to segment it out each level of the water column and then, you know, front to back, across, et cetera. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and that was a real lesson that uh, that we learned early in the season. Um, and then you kind of get to this post spawn fish, which is your kind of summertime fish. Yeah. And they're hanging out. You can almost read it like trout water in a sense because they're hanging out behind rocks they're conserving energy you know they're picking up easy food in the runs and you know the back of pools um they're very aggressive uh in the way that they fight that time of year um is the other thing uh, they'll jump and yeah, they'll do that three, four times and yeah, they're, they're super fun, but they're a little bit more opportunistic, um, that, that kind of post spawn fish is than that pre spawn, you know, they're kind of guarding their territory and staying tucked under and realizing that, you know, they're apex predators and they're hanging out where apex, apex predators should. You know, they're they're at the points of uh, how do you say like structure? Um, you know, they're they're hidden well beneath it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in kind of summertime, it's a that that post spawn is a, a a little bit of a free for all and. Oftentimes, again, those bigger fish are hanging out a little bit deeper, and we've done really well with crayfish patterns. Um, but yeah, kind of having said that, um, it's it's this manipulation of patterns throughout the day. Mm -hmm. You know, you may start with poppers in the morning, something like a deer hair popper. Um, I don't think we've caught one fish on like a foam popper this year. Hmm. It's all been on deer hair. It just creates so much turbulence and then swims in that first one to three inches of the water column um, after your probably first six strips. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you, you're fishing something much deeper during the day, you know, and then you're kind of, you know, again, going neutrally buoyant or, or something on the surface at night, mm -hmm. you know, come summertime with these post post spawn fish. And They're real predictable, which is the lovely part. Yeah. Once you start to figure it out, it's like, oh, that's what they yeah. kind of scenario. Yeah. Are you seeing a move um, more in certain times of the year? You know, like really chase down something? Oh, summertime. Man, That those post-spawn fish are um, super active. I mean, um, they, they, uh, there's this phenomena in, uh, on the Wisconsin River they call the crash. And that's where uh, bass will actually work together, like, almost like Golden Dorado, um, and school up bait fish and then just go batshit crazy on them. Mm. And we've seen that phenomena on the Milwaukee River um, before. And uh, certainly not as prolific as it is on the Wisconsin, but uh, we've seen these fish actually actively work together to school up bait fish 
at the top these chokes of these islands and uh yeah makes for a pretty exciting top water bite yeah i'm sure uh, uh, i'm betting you're you're recording this on paper or something every time you see that where and when i can uh, see that in your repertoire moves for sure absolutely yeah now i keep a good record of uh where we fished when we fished water temperature water level um yeah i i try to break it down as much as i can for the 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 small area that i do fish the most that's pretty pretty fun he's always valuable i remember when i first started to fish with a guy he was from wisconsin and uh, we no fish, kidding. yeah we fished for uh, tiger tiger muskie up in uh, pine view reservoir around here and, oh wow! And I'll never forget. He, I came over to his place. It was like first time I went fishing with him. He's like, "This is where we're gonna go." And he like rolls out the map, and he had everything pin dotted with numbers. And then he had these, the old like black and white mead cattle uh, um, journals, you know. And he'd go to the number in the journal, and he'd be like, "Okay, it was this day, this temperature, and it was a thirty-five. And all right, and we knew every minute detail of uh what happened during that catch and there were dots everywhere we would, and those <laughs> those musky guys are the best at it, <laughs> it you know honestly i you know they'll i'll get a call from somebody and they're like oh yeah no it's like this full moon phase and we got to be out tonight and yeah. with this weather and barometric change. And I'm like, Whoa, whoa <laughs> hold on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you, just, was... it, you just, you uh, just talked way over my head. Right. And we would go out and bang them. And I didn't know. I was like, I fished with a can of worms, you know, mealworms and bobber when I was yeah. a kid in Pennsylvania. And then I came out and was, you know, doing all the climbing, skiing, et cetera. And I fished for fun on my off days, you know, every once in a while with this guy and, we would go out and bang t- tiger muskie and we boat six, eight fish a day. And I was like, I thought that was the norm. Holy schmoly. And uh, I had no clue. And he was just the wizard. You know, he, we go to these, oh yeah, there's a spring over here. They like to hang out in this area. And we just put like three casts in there. And it was like, they come out of the woodwork. Really, oh really, yeah. Really cool. Really cool. He taught me a lot. Yeah. Taught me a lot. I wish I paid more attention now, but. Oh, well. That's right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if only I would have listened to my grandfather, I'd be uh, much more astute. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about during spawn? What What are you what, what are you doing there? We stay away from them. To be honest, you know, you fish a different species. And what are you targeting during you know? that time of year? Uh, well, one of the things that a lot of people don't consider um, is that Wisconsin actually has more square mileage of trout stream than Colorado. So we do a lot of trips to the driftless in the spring, mm. uh, kind of during the spawn, uh, just to let them, you know, do their thing. Um, and yeah, I, I, I can't say that I have like this unbelievable grasp of their spawning now and now it's over, mm-hmm. you know? Um, particularly with our low water um it it kind of lasted a while so we were we were catching both pre and post spawn fish for a while Mm -hmm. but generally we were doing a lot of trips to the driftless region uh and fishing inland trout wow we could have a whole nother call on the driftless region pretty rad place there oh man yeah it's pretty up there (laughs) Oh man, it's extraordinary. I uh I don't have any great stories about catching big fish, but I know a whole bunch of people that do. <laughs> so well, we <laughs> they do really them. well. Yeah. That's very cool. Very cool. Um any other tactics you want to share or wh- what about some of your setups? Are you changing your setups during um those two phases that you're fishing? <sighs> Uh, big time. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of those, um, and a lot of it depends on whether you're fishing open water or you're fishing river water, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, open water, you can get away with like a triple density line, 
uh, full sync, you know, something like an S5, um, throwing neutrally buoyant flies is really effective um, during that, that pre-spawn period of time. But if you're throwing a sinking line in a river, it creates a huge belly, and then all of a sudden you're blasting that fly a million miles an hour past that fish. It doesn't, doesn't matter. You're not even fishing that fish so um we use a lot of sink tips um and uh yeah one of my yeah favorite kind of sink tips at the moment is the uh rio predator um it's just got a lot of options as far as um their sink tips are concerned and they all cast identically throughout the whole uh range so i've really liked those uh we fish a ton of those but like i said we're fishing we generally saltwater eight weights um eights and sevens um i still prefer prefer eights uh, i don't know i think they cast better um but we definitely play a lot around if the water gets high it it I'm very line heavy, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be running a hover intermediate, um, you know, an intermediate type three and type three, type seven, um, or type six. Uh, so yeah, we're playing with that depth constantly, particularly pre-spawn because you do get a lot of that runoff and those fish just spread out, you know, it, and it's it takes a little bit of um, sweat equity to figure out what part of the water column they're in. Then, like you said, once you figure it out, they're dialed. Yeah, yeah. Once you figure yeah. it out, it, it it seems pretty predictable. But yeah, I, I, it can change day to day. I mean, I've the. I mean, there's definitely such thing as a bite window. You know, um, and that was what, that's the one thing I can't seem to have figured out on, you know, the Wisconsin, uh, I'm sorry, the Milwaukee River is the bite window. Because one day it's at one o'clock, the next day it's at four o'clock. And uh, yeah, it doesn't have a lot of rhyme or reason. So I, I, my take on it is, is if you're if you're out there all day, they can't hide from you all day. They can try, you know, <laughs> you know, they can, they can try, but yeah, they, they can't hide all day. I love it. I love it. Oh man, Joe, it's so good to hear you. Uh, let's do this. Let's take a quick break. We come back. I want you to break down your day. Just, um, just like you would, I know you have a big coaching background and, uh, that's typically your strategy for the day is to really line it up so you can be successful. Um, so we'll hear from our sponsors. We'll be right back, everyone. Angler's Coffee. We love fueling your next cast. We've been roasting coffee before coffee was cool. www.anglerscoffee.com Dupa Fish. Coming soon. Pre-register now and get notified. www.dupafish, that's D-U-P-E, a fish.com all right, everyone, welcome back. Again, we've got uh, Joseph Davies on the line, Joe Davies, uh, however you want to go about it. He goes both ways there. Um, <laughs> Joe, good, to, good to have you back uh, on the show again. Uh, this has been enjoyable for me. Before we get really rolling on this uh, last bit of the segment, um, how can people get a hold of you? I know you have your Instagram, which is tilted3.0. Um, but, uh, yep. what's, what's the web address for, what is it? The fly fishers? Um, no, um, the best way to get a hold of me would be on my personal email, Joe Davies, fly fishing at gmail.com. Or you can contact me directly at four, three, five, six, Oh, four, five, seven, five, one. Um, and to be honest, most people get a hold of me via Instagram, Okay, you know, they they might have seen a couple pics and gone, hey man, that'd be cool to do. Yep. And uh I'll I'll do that. Um and uh yeah, you can get a hold of me anytime. 
All right. Yeah. Cool. cool. Hopefully uh, some people get out on the water with you. It'd be, be cool to hear some, some stories about that too. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we talked about uh, this before we left, but I want you to break down your day. Um, you're, you're a guide and I know you're really a pretty structured guy as much ADHD uh, as you have in, in uh, yeah. the same way, but, um, we do, we, I think uh, that's why you and I got along so well as we, we really structured our days. So break it down for me. Yeah. So, um, ah, geez, there's, uh, there's always boat maintenance, no matter what, um, you know, you're, you're either charging trolling motors or, you know, making, making sure you're full of gas and I don't know, your, your gas to oil ratio is right. I'm still <laughs> always nervous about that. <laughs> but, um, but having said that we usually, uh, on a full, uh, it, you, I, I, haven't run many half days because a lot of the guys that get on the boat are grinders, you know? So we start probably, uh, summertime nine in the morning and, uh, maybe take a moderate break for lunch, uh, about 1230 and, uh, we go till dark or, or the client taps out. I mean, that's, that was kind of the way that, um, I approach training, you know, you, you, you want to get the most out of every single, every single client, every single athlete. Um, and, uh, the, the day's done when they feel like it's done or we can't see anymore one or the other, you know? Um, but a lot of these guys appreciate the, um, yeah, maybe the extra push you might give them to fish this certain section and it pays off, Yeah, you know, or, um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to, and I've been asked by a lot of guides, would you rather have the big fish come in the first 10 casts or the last 10? And I'm like, last 10, 100% of the time. Leave on the high you note, know? Right? Yeah, and on the high note. <laughs> and I think that um, a lot of the clients that have gravitated towards me um, have been of that ilk, you know, they're, they're okay grinding out for five hours because we're, we're looking for big fish, you know, whether it be bass or pike or musky, um, they're, they're willing to put in that time. And, uh, then, oh yeah, then the day starts almost, you know, once everything's done and hopefully it was, a a grand success, um, you're trailing, you, you know, you're trailering that boat back to your place, you're cleaning it, you're, uh, gassing it, you're putting everything on a trickle charger for the next day. Um, and then it starts over you know, and, uh, but I've kept it really simple. I am a hundred percent willing to put in the time when that client is willing to do the same. If they want, if they want to grind for 12 hours, I'll be there at, you know, 12 hours and 30 minutes pushing them on. Yep. Yeah, there's you know. there is something to be said about that. I, I mean, it's, I think it's the last two trips I've been on, um, where it's been guiding trips. We've really had that conversation of, gosh, what is it about? It seems like the water turns on as soon as the motors turn off, right? Yeah. Um, you got these guys buzzing up and down the river or whatever, and then all of a sudden, it's like you 
ninety percent of them head to the dock, rack it up for the day at five o'clock or whatever it is. Yeah, I get it, man. You're a guy. I, you got a life. You got family too. It's a job. I yeah. totally get it. But there seems to be a payoff if you have, uh, you know, someone that's willing to take a day out of your trip or two and say, let's yeah. let's grind it out a little later, or let's do an early morning and then stop midday and then do a later part of the day. Absolutely. I've seen that too. There's, there's benefits both ways. Absolutely. And, um, oh man, it's just, like I said, the stoke is just too high. Yeah. I, I I'm too invested and it's too much fun for, for me not to want to stay out after dark and, you know, take some risks getting in or something like that. That's I don't know, right. you know? Um, but no, I, uh, yeah, I've been real, real blessed with the types of clients I've had, you know, and uh, again, a lot of them have been grinders. Um, a lot of guys just grateful to be 40 minutes away from the city and out in the middle of nowhere. You know, um, and that's one of the beautiful things about Milwaukee is that you can drive 40 minutes north and just about get lost. You yeah. know, yeah, so it's <laughs> it's a it's a beautiful experience one way or another. But um, I'm always willing to put in that extra time if 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 that client is willing to do the same. Well, Joe, it's been great catching up and, you know, learning a lot from you again uh, on this round of your personal adventure in life. It's exciting to hear that uh, you're doing so well, my friend, and I'm yeah. looking forward to coming and visiting you for sure. There's so many of those trips I got on the docket, but this is one I definitely want to do. Uh, I've been dying to go get some warm water stuff, so make it happen my friend and absolutely um, thanks for being on the show buddy oh anytime all right everyone we'll see you next week and uh have a great week talk to you soon